Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason, and today we are talking on our audio podcast with Glenn Reynolds. He is a professor of law at the University of Tennessee and is better known to everywhere over the world as the founder and proprietor of Instapundit.com, one of the first, biggest, and still best aggregator sites of commentary, links, and you name it. Glenn, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you were in the news recently. Uh, rather than talking about the news, you actually created news uh, in North Carolina uh, a few days ago when uh, protesters uh, pissed off about Keith Scott stormed an interstate. A local TV station, WBTV, tweeted, Live now, protesters on I-277 stopping traffic and surrounding vehicles. Avoid. Watch live. You retweeted that with the three-line word, run them down. What happened next? Uh, well, it should be known that's a, that was against the context of a whole lot of reports of violence uh, and uh, rioting, not just protesting in this event. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and I guess that's what set me off with that tweet. Uh, so uh, honestly, nothing happened right away. Uh, I tweeted that. I think it was 8.51 p.m. at night, uh, read my book, went to bed. Uh, got up the next morning, opened my email, and people were like, why are you banned on Twitter? And I was like, I have no idea. Uh, and it actually took me a while to figure out what had happened. But uh, over the night, that it, while I slept peacefully, it had somehow exploded. Uh, I think a bunch of uh, lefty sites bombarded Twitter. And I'm still honestly not sure whether I was just automatically suspended by a bot because enough people uh, reported abuse or spam or whatever, uh, or whether there was human judgment involved. So before we get to that question or, or whether or not we can answer it, what what did it feel like? I mean, as somebody who obviously you have a life in meat space, uh, I know, you know, I've seen the pictures, I've met you in real life and all of that. But what, it, you know, was there an emotional impact to suddenly, you know, being cut off from Twitter? Uh, you know, it was mostly puzzlement initially. And of course, one of the problems is when when people don't like something you say on Twitter and they get you suspended, then you can't respond. You've been not only uh, silenced, but sort of neutralized. Uh, so once I figured out what was going on, which I actually found out from a post on Twitchy, mm-hmm. uh, I posted something on my blog, which basically said, look, I wasn't saying ran down peaceful innocent protesters. I was saying uh, drive through these blocks of people who look like they're trying to kill you, uh, and uh, which I saw as a fairly crucial difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, And that was... Um, that was what I put on my blog, but then I had had to fiddle with Twitter. Eventually, I found an email from them that said if I clicked on a link and followed some instructions, I could get my account restored, uh, which I did. Uh, they required me to delete the tweet, so as soon as they I got back up, I mm-hmm. put up a link to Twitchy that preserved the tweet, so nobody would think I was trying to hide stuff. Uh, and then it was just a matter of uh, dealing with all of the uh, anger that that stirred up and the uh, you know misinterpretations or. So well, talk a little yeah. bit about that, because uh, I, and I, uh, I, you know, as as a longtime reader and uh, I think somewhere I've posted uh, you were involved or I, I quoted you actually one of the very first things I wrote for reason, a, a short piece about the Lopez decision going back to what would it be? Ninety five. Oh, that was the thing I wrote. Yeah, that was yeah. something I wrote for Cato back in uh, yeah. ninety four. I think. Uh, yeah. So uh, but in any case, um, you know, I wrote a defense of your free speech. What, what was your intention in saying run them down? Because Twitter, when you look at the terms of use, they say, you know, basically any incitement to violence and, and a variety of other things is grounds for being banned or suspended. Um, what were you intending, and and how was it misconstrued? Well, if it was misconstrued, I wasn't intending enough, to be honest. I mean, what was really happening is I was lying on the couch with my phone, retweeting stuff, and occasionally commenting on it. And if I had thought about that for five seconds or even three, I would have said what I meant in a way that wasn't so exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just didn't. And you know, that's one of the dangers of Twitter. Uh, and I've always been aware of it. And, you know, I have over 580,000 tweets and uh, I guess statistically the odds just caught up with me. Right. right. And this uh, is the first time that you've been uh, you've been yeah. suspended or blocked. First. So what what was your what if you had taken, you know, more than three words to uh, what what was your intention or, or what was the message that you would have? Said? I would have said something like this is awful. Don't stop for these people. It's too dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know, I might I might have said, you know, run them down if you have to to get away. But I wouldn't have said it in a way that made people think, or in some cases, I suspect, uh, pretend to think that I was saying target these people just because, you know, you can. 
Uh, do you – and there were reports of uh, uh, cars being kind of hit and vandalized. Or oh, yeah, windshield, windshield like smashed. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a woman uh, on the phone with a local TV station who was a truck driver whose truck was being looted and was uh, scared for her life, she said. Now, you know, what's interesting is that uh, as as a law professor and as somebody of a libertarian bent of mind, and uh, you, would you, uh, I mean, just as a side note, do you consider yourself libertarian, conservative? Do you use a different descriptor that uh, fits you best? I, I consider myself libertarian. I mean, there are so many different flavors of libertarianism that uh, the most important thing you do as soon as you consider yourself libertarian <laughs> is announce that nobody else is a real libertarian like yes, you. that's right. Uh, <laughs> but... Yeah. Uh, but that said, yes, you know, and that means that I'm a believer in as minimal a government as we can get. And, you know, uh, I sort of when I talk about my policy preferences, sometimes people are surprised. But I have to explain to them that, uh, you know, there's sort of the theory of the second best. There's the situation I would have if I controlled everything. And there's the incremental policy thing I would do next that I hope will make things better. Uh, but, yeah, I'm certainly not a conservative. I mean, you know, the, well, the, the, one of the things I was going to bring up is that you have been uh, critical, and I know that you've linked certainly to a lot of Reason stuff, and Radley Balco, both when he was at Cato, when he was at Reason, when he was at the Huffington Post, now at the Washington Post, talking about the militarization of police and police abuse. Uh, you have issues about cert the surveillance state and things like that. And I'm not saying that you're a, a super... Uh, you know, you're you're totally in on any kind of negativity towards law enforcement by any stretch. But, um, you know, where where do you see the country going with these questions about uh, Black Lives Matter protests or more broadly, there is a real concerted and heartfelt and I think meaningful pushback against some of the ways in which police have been doing business for decades now. Well, you know, the biggest problem with the police is not that they shoot people sometimes because that's inevitable with their job. Uh, it's not even that they shoot the wrong people sometimes because that's kind of also inevitable uh, over time. The real problem with the police is that they are perceived, and I think it's a correct perception, not to be accountable when they shoot the wrong person for the wrong reasons. Uh, and it's not only that. I mean, they're not perceived not to be accountable for a wide variety of misdeeds. Uh, and th they're perceived that way because, in fact, they get away with a lot. Yeah. And what what is what's driving that? Why do why do police get away? I mean, you, and, you know, I know we've run stories about this. I know you've written stuff about it. You're also besides being the proprietor of Instapundit.com. You are a, a regular contributor to USA Today, where you write a, a, a weekly column that is uh, pretty wonderful. I try never to miss it. Um, but why do cops get away with stuff that you or I would not get away with? Well, a couple of reasons. One is they, as a, they're sort of a paramilitary organization, which you know means that uh, camaraderie and esprit de corps are a big part of what they do, and that basically boils down in real life to covering for your buddy. Mm -hmm. And since cops typically control the initial reporting and gathering of evidence uh, in an event that happens, it's pretty easy for them to protect each other that way. Uh, then second of all, prosecutors depend heavily on the cops to do their job. Uh, and they know that unless a case is truly egregious, the police will be angry if they prosecute a police officer. Uh, so they're inclined not to. And then, of course, jurors tend to be pretty sympathetic to cops, too. So even if they do prosecute them, the cop has a pretty good chance of walking. And uh, on top of that, they're usually unionized. And so they have a lot of political protection. So that that's a pretty good recipe for uh, getting out of jail free most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, to bring it back to Twitter and free speech. Now, Twitter, um, and you know, and you're you're a libertarian of of some sort of flavor. I I think I'm a hot fudge Sunday pop tart style libertarian. <laughs> Uh, and I won't. I'm a uh, low carb libertarian. Okay, yeah. So you're you're a, a paleo. Well, not a paleo libertarian. Maybe a no, paleo a, diet libertarian, but yeah, not yeah. Um, what bacon libertarian? Do you uh, does Twitter have the right to ban people that it says you know what for whatever reason uh, you know I don't like your speech get the hell off of my platform? Uh, yeah, generally speaking, sure. They're a private company. They're not bound by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's a little tricky about Twitter is that they're a publicly traded company and they tell their investors as well as their customers that they don't censor. But an awful lot of people who paid close attention to what they do uh, conclude that, in fact, they they come down much harder on people on, on the right. right. Than they Broadly do on, construed right. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, the non-left, I guess you could say, uh, you, you get you get away with a lot more if you're on the left. And, but, and, well, you know, a, a big, uh, you know, a recent kind of cause uh, related to that was uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, the uh, Breitbart editor, alt-right uh, kind of uh, figure, was banned. Is this Breitbart London or Breitbart Tech or both? Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah, and, uh, not, not the U.S. Breitbart. He was, uh, he was suspended or, or banned permanently for life after tweeting various things at an actress. Uh, and that, uh, that led to uh, a lot, uh, heaping amounts of racial abuse on a, on a black woman. Do, you know, do you think, is that good? Um, is that bad? Um, should Twitter be more wide open and letting people duke it out? They do have a series of, tech, you know, of uh, tools that allow people to block uh, or to avoid saying things they don't want to see. Is that enough or should they be policing I, uh, I, themselves? I think they should do less policing and give people more tools to protect against, uh, you know, being trolled and threatened and such. Uh, that would certainly be my preference. The other problem that, that makes it a little rougher is and this is not just Twitter, this is sort of all the social media stuff. Uh, it's all kind of a semi-monopoly. I mean, it's a small number of companies uh, that really control almost all social media. And they all kind of lean left. I mean, Facebook has been accused, and I think, again, quite credibly, of having a lot of political bias. And, and they've done experiments to, that suggest that they could swing an election by manipulating their flow of uh, news and, and views. And, you know, at some level, uh, you you say that's just private enterprise, right. they can do what they want. But at another level, it's it's a, it's a little more troubling when they are kind of a monopoly and they're politically in the tank with an administration that is doing them a lot of favors. Uh, so, well, what are the favors? And, and let's, let's, let's fixate on this a little bit um, because it is an interesting question, especially from a libertarian perspective. Uh, you know, Twitter does not have, I mean, if to the, they, have, they have great market share. They don't have a monopoly on social media, on free speech. Neither does Facebook, even though these are the, you know, they're beyond the McDonald's of, uh, you know, whatever McDonald's might be to fast food restaurants or Walmart is to retail. These guys are even bigger. Uh, but do they, is it, or, I mean, you're not saying that they should be forced to kind of enforce a fairness doctrine or anything. You're, you're arguing that it is, for the benefit of public discourse, that they relax a little bit and let people speak more freely? Or Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not even sure what a fairness doctrine for social media would look right. like, but I wouldn't, <laughs> if I figured out what it was, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be for it. Uh, yeah. But but uh, I'm not so sure that uh, we aren't approaching the point where people might want to think about antitrust. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, I'm, and I know we're past the point where if these were companies that uh, operated with a slant toward Republicans, everyone would be calling for antitrust regulation right mm -hmm. away uh, and talking about the horrible dangers of this. Uh, but what they really are is they, they are quite demonstrably, uh, and there's been a lot of reporting on this actually, in, in bed with the Obama administration. I mean, Google people have been meeting at the White House all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're also being very lightly regulated by the Obama administration. They get breaks on uh, everything from taxes to uh, immigration. And that really does make you suspicious when it also looks like they're sort of slanting stories in a particular political direction. By the same token, we know that Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, eBay, uh, you know, that they have been forced to or and I don't think it was quite willingly, but they've been forced to cough up huge amounts of data or to allow, you know, kind of vacuum cleaners on stuff. Yes. So are they I mean, is Let's let's to put it slightly differently. Are they in bed with the Obama administration for ideological reasons or is it that they also realize that the federal government, uh, you know, can do whatever it wants to them and can, you know, Microsoft uh, going back 15 years uh, or so, Microsoft had been doing pretty well and then they got a major antitrust suit against them. Uh, that tied them up for years. I mean, are they are these guys quaking in fear or are they marching arm in arm with a kind of uh, liberal or progressive uh, uh, ideological agenda? Well, it's probably some of both. You know, I think it was Al Capone who said you get more with a kind word and a gun than a kind word alone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what, or the Mexican drug lords, I think they're something as silver or lead. You know, they will bribe yeah. you or they will kill you. So I think I think coercion and favors kind of go hand in hand in these kind of things. Uh, but it's definitely, I think, kind of troubling. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I have to say, I, I wrote about this a, a few months ago when I was criticizing Twitter and such. You know, in the early days of the blogosphere, we had a lot of independent blog sites. And that was sort of a drag for some people because it was relatively hard to set up your own website, even if you had to set it up on Blogger. 
like sites like Facebook or Twitter make it much easy to just log on and start putting your views out. But on the other hand, now you're on somebody else's platform and they have control. Right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about that because, uh, you know, and we are talking to Glenn Reynolds. Uh, you know him both as a University of Tennessee law professor, a USA Today columnist, and perhaps best known as the proprietor, the founder, uh, the Internet's Instapundit at instapundit.com. And this is the reason audio podcast. You can find us at iTunes on SoundCloud. Go to reason.com slash podcast. We also have RSS feeds both for our audio uh, podcasts as well as our videos. Um, talk a bit about that. The The Wild West of the Internet, it was probably dead by the time you started Instapundit in, I believe, August of 2001. Are we, you know, is it that the Internet now and that, so you started, you know, uh, uh, Instapundit is 15 years old. Um are we so domesticated now? Is this kind of, is it a mature industry almost where that early spirit of kind of free speech and of flame wars and where people would say the most horrible things and it was kind of expected, like that seems to have been banished from today's internet. Are we in a kind of corporatized, bureaucratized, um, uh, you know, uh, snowflake world yeah. now? Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you want to think about the role of sort of Twitter management uh, or whatever, it's basically they're like the HR department for the Internet now. Uh, and uh, that's not that appealing to me. Yeah. What um, do you think? Uh, here is a, is a question that I come back to often. Be, and, I, and I say this as somebody I've been working at Reason since 1993. When I joined, it was definitely part of the alternative media because – there was a very big gulf between uh, sites, you know, we're based in LA or, you know, part of us is and our headquarters is there. The difference between reason and the LA times was massive. Uh, nowadays we've had Matt Welch, my colleague, uh, co-author on uh, the declaration of independence actually left reason and worked for the LA times and then came back to reason because it was a more vital institution. Uh, you know, th th things have really changed. Um, but do you feel like freedom of speech is simultaneously, it seems that we have more and more ways of getting our messages out there, whether they are good, bad, or ugly, but there is also an ever-increasing attempt to control and regulate speech. Yeah. Um, you know, what, 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 is this just kind of, uh, you know, are we Sherlock Holmes and uh, Professor Moriarty falling over <laughs> Reichenbach Falls forever and ever infinitely, or... Are we winning? Or are we losing if we're on the side of more expression rather than less expression? Well, you know, I actually wrote a column a while back on this, and, and, and my sort of tagline was, speech is freer, but people are less free. And, and that's mm. sort of how it is. There are lots of ways to get your uh, message out, but the powers that be are, and also, honestly, a lot of your fellow citizens are just a lot more comfortable about, about punishing people and silencing them. Yeah. Do you feel, uh, and this is something, I, uh, you know, I'll... I'll uh, be, uh, I guess it's not a proprietary secret for reason, but I'm sure you've seen this a lot in your own traffic. You know, five or six years ago, I'd say, Instapundent was probably our single biggest traffic source, or one of them, you know, and, and you're, you were, uh, uh, have done an, an incredible job of aggregating. And I think in the post I wrote defending your freedom of speech, I say, you know, Instapundent is the first or second site that I check every day after reason. Um, be, you know, it's that central. Um, but nowadays, most of our traffic referrals come from Facebook. Uh, then Twitter is second. Uh, do you find that Facebook uh, and Twitter, and I suppose, uh, you know, we're getting into an area where, you know, places like Instagram and Snapchat supposedly have more daily users than uh, Twitter, that you have been displaced as, as a first order aggregator, um, even if your traffic is still strong. And does that worry you, not because the government is suppressing speech, but to kind of go back to what you were saying, these other bottlenecks or these gatekeepers, you know, new gatekeepers are growing up in a world that was once uh, kind of a big sky country for whoever showed up. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, it's my, my traffic continues to grow. It doesn't grow as fast as it did in those heady early days, but it's, mm -hmm. it goes up every year. Uh, but, you know, I, a lot more people are on Facebook. And uh, my own experience is that Facebook drives a lot of traffic and Twitter doesn't drive that much. People, uh, I actually, somebody was saying in my comments that he posts recipes and people never follow the link to the recipe. They just look at the picture. 
Uh, whereas <laughs> Facebook sends him a lot of traffic. He says it's just amazing the difference. Uh, and, and that's kind of my experience. But, you know, yeah, I mean, people still suck up to me for traffic. Uh, but it is, I guess that's in part because you can't really suck up to Facebook for traffic. You've got to market it out there somehow. You know, and if we knew where to uh, suck up, I, I suspect we'd be uh, doing that. But we are <laughs> we are talking to Glenn Reynolds. He's the Insta Pundit. And uh, you reminded me in terms of uh, the traffic. Uh, we, I mean, you still uh, see people talking about the Insta Lanch, what happens when you would get a uh, get an Insta Pundit link. And I can remember early days at Reason where we would actually have our server break down under the, uh, the strain of too many people coming. <laughs> Um, what happened with the University of Tennessee? You also had some fallout from your tweet that got you temporarily suspended from Twitter. What's going on there that you can talk well, about? Uh, I can talk about everything. It's all over. The University yeah. of Tennessee uh, sort of took them a little while, uh, but they uh, came out with a statement that my speech is protected by the First Amendment and uh, you know not even worth considering any sort of disciplinary action. And I was gratified to see that. Uh, they actually got... Uh, the initial announcement uh, from my dean said something about an investigation, and that set a lot of people off. Uh, and they actually heard a lot from a lot of alumni uh, who were very angry about that. And I think they thought by sending that message out they were going to please the alumni. But it turns out the alumni of the University of Tennessee are pretty big fans of free speech, and actually a lot of them read Instapundit. And uh, they really got a pretty substantial pushback. Much, I was just talking to somebody today uh, and, and discovered it was much bigger even than I had thought. So um, – I think that played a role. But I also think, you know, we have Tennessee has a green light rating from FIRE, the mm-hmm. Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. That's the best you can do. And they are actually pretty proud of that. They brag about it when they testify to the state legislature. And the state legislature seems to care about free expression on campus. So I think that helped, too. Um, what what makes uh, Tennessee, University of Tennessee in uh, Knoxville, uh, which is a wonderful college town. I've, I've, I've driven by there several times and uh, spent a little bit of time there. Uh, what makes it uh, unique about uh, among university campuses? Because to hear, you know, uh, fire doesn't give a lot of green lights out. And, uh, you know, most of the stories we hear, uh, and you certainly write a lot about higher education, is – that, the, you know, the lights are going out all over academia. Um, what what makes uh, Tennessee uh, a kind of more vital bastion of, of free speech and free expression? Well, you know, that's actually a good question. And I think it has to do with the politics of the state of Tennessee. I mean, Tennesseans are just fairly sensible people and um, kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't really call Tennesseans libertarians, but they're kind of small government, don't mess with me, conservative types that kind of overlap with libertarians a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they're just sort of very uh, well grounded. So I think I think that the latest PC fads just don't have as much traction here. And uh, I think that makes a big difference. Uh, as a uh, final point, let me ask you, you uh, talked earlier when you were talking about libertarianism and your kind of version of libertarianism. There is the the big, uh, you know, kind of uh, if if you were the king of the world, of course, you would renounce your crown or, or make everybody co-equal and we would have a, a glorious utopia of utopias. Um, but in, uh, you know, short of that, you go for the next best thing. Who are you going to vote for in the election? Have you made a decision? And on what grounds do you decide? Are you going this way, that way, or possibly a third um, way? You know, to be honest, it doesn't make any difference. In Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, this place is as far from a swing state as it could be. It didn't even make any difference in the Republican primary. Uh, so I don't know. You know, I. And actually, I think you and I were going back and forth on this on Facebook earlier. I'd really like to be more enthusiastic about Gary Johnson, but I feel like in this really special year for libertarians, uh, he might not have been the best public face. Uh, now, maybe I'm wrong. He's polling better than libertarian candidates have done in the past, you know, yeah, but tremendously I, much more. So, he may, but, he yeah. may appeal better to people who aren't longtime libertarians uh, than he does to people who are. Uh, and I may very well want. I, vote for him if I can bring myself to vote. But of course, it will make no difference. But actually, maybe that's a reason to vote for him, because I can vote for him and raise his totals and help him out and have a completely clear conscience because my vote won't make the least bit of difference anyway. Are you a uh, you're certainly a never Hillary? Are you also a never Trumper? No, here's the argument for Trump that I find a little bit hard to dismiss. And it's not an argument based on Trump being good. It's just that 
everybody in the establishment hates him. And I'm not saying vote for him to stick a thumb in the eye of the establishment, though I got nothing against that in right. general. It's that a President Trump will be very constrained by the media, by Congress, even by Republicans in Congress, yeah. by sort of the deep state and the bureaucracy. Whereas the Hillary email scandal kind of and stuff really indicates that Hillary just isn't constrained by anybody. So if you had to choose between Trump and Hillary, even if they're equally bad and maybe even if Trump is inherently worse, uh, I think he's likely to do a lot less damage because of that. Yeah, that's a, and you know, one of the things that is always hard to game with politics, particularly presidential politics, is it's an ecosystem question, right? If, if Bill Clinton had managed to get uh, Clinton care through in his first two years and won a bigger majority in 1994, uh, et cetera, like, you know, the 90s probably would have been a very different than he yes. managed the unthinkable, right, which was to elect a Republican Congress that uh, actually kind of acted in a small government fashion, at least in certain instances. Yeah, better than they've done better than the Republican Congress that Obama elected somehow. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, th this is the uh, for me, the uh, libertarian optimism is, you know, things can always get worse. <laughs> and they do. Right. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, we have been talking with Glenn Reynolds, the University of Tennessee professor of law, who was recently uh, suspended briefly from Twitter. Uh, read about it at instapundit.com. He is the Internet's first one and only instapundit.com. Uh, Glenn, thanks so much for talking to Reason today. Thanks for having me. For Reason's podcast, I am Nick Gillespie. Please check us out at iTunes, SoundCloud. We have RSS feeds up the wazoo. Go to Reason.com podcast to subscribe. Please rate and review everything that we do. We like to hear the uh, feedback, whether you're happy, sad, or somewhere in between. Thanks so much.